we've just gotten access to the internet really and found a way of communicating globally but a bit of a different way of communicating like it's not face to face where you're aware that it's a human being you're talking to it's little text boxes that are popping up and um, which changes the nature of it for a start yeah. it does feel to me like the general level of dialogue has decreased in many ways um recently there's more anger between opposing groups left and right brexit and remain trump and not trump and more yes yeah, just this real strong sense of polarization coming through and a real attachment to one's own views is that your sense of the world too um yes in short i th i think i think that's definitely seems to be part of what's happening and i don't know if it's because you know in in the 90s and the early part of the the 2000s it felt like you know back in the days when people were saying oh well i don't i don't vote because they're all the same mm -hmm. you know there was that sense certainly in the uk wasn't there of, it, of politics really being a homogenous yeah M mass That's true yeah um the blair years there was i mean yeah was kind of a conservative guy so. it, 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 yeah <laughs> exactly one, so it, it 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 felt like there was really no differentiation in yeah. the sense and it feels like now we're moving out of that into these much more polarized yeah it's a good point states. i never thought of it that way yeah which is it's obvious actually now you say it yeah mm. and i think in a way that then um, maybe more part of what's happening is that things that were already happening but a bit more below the surface are becoming much more evident you know things it feels like we're in this phase when when things are coming out you know we've just had the whole round of people being exposed for for being sexual predators mm. in hollywood and so on people people coming out saying yeah m me too you know it feels like there's a there's a lot being exposed in the course of that um ac across the across the board really yeah it is it is a unique opportunity right and i think that it gets defined by how we use it in this period of history that we've uh, like never been all for being able to communicate about and just fundamentally understand the structures of the world we live in okay so like I was watching um, an economics documentary on YouTube on central banking, okay? And it must have been made maybe in the late 90s or early 2000s, and then it was one of the early videos on YouTube. And at the end of it, it says, like, if you'd like to know more about this, send a self-stamped addressed envelope off to. And <laughs> that's, uh, they had no idea of the world that was just around the corner. But now we have the opportunity like never before we've gone from a world where people wouldn't even know what the king looked like you know 150 years ago to um one where people can really delve into the underlying economic political structures that are creating the world for us and can deconstruct that and question well, what why is it this way why does all the money have the queen's head on it what does that really mean and um, why do we have these wars periodically what's going on at the terrorist events um but what's also playing out in that discovery of knowledge is you know to be human for the longest time has been quite a traumatic experience with wars and bubonic plagues and all sorts going on and there is that then attachment this kind of i think certainty addiction right is the the term you used before um if we find a security in our opinions okay and I, I, one experience that sticks out in my mind about this is I was at um, a, a meditative group years ago, uh, having a conversation with someone at dinner afterwards, and we were having a disagreement on something. Um, and at some point, the other person just like let go his opinion and saw my point of view for a moment, right? And I was like, oh, that's an unusual thing to do. And what it was reflective of to me was that they cultivated a deeper sense of identity, right? So there was a felt sense of security that if I, if I let go of this opinion I'm holding so tightly, I'll still exist almost, right? I won't dissolve with that. Exactly. And that's what feels like is lacking. And it, um, so I look at that in a kind of Eastern metaphysical way about the nature of the self. And I've also heard psychotherapists like Donald Winnicott talk about it in terms of 
when there's bad parenting or there's no healthy attachment developed there, uh, ideas themselves become kind of weird parental figures. Which you claim. Abs absolutely. And I think that's really central to the whole conversation, isn't it? When our whole, when those ideas and beliefs are our identity, and like you say, particularly when we've not had, when they're a replacement for what we didn't have, it's not surprising then that we'll, we'll absolutely stand our ground. I mean, pe pe as we know, people are willing to die for their ideas, mm. their beliefs. It goes that deep, doesn't it? So the idea then that, um, you know, we feel personally attacked when somebody disagrees with our, our views about politics, uh, I think really cuts to the core of it, doesn't it? We, we believe we are that. And certainly in my experience, inquiry gives us a way to start to, to unravel that, to see that we will still stand if, if somebody disagrees with us or we aren't that collection of beliefs or positions. I think that's absolutely yeah. central. It's fundamental to get over it being a threatening thing. I think what goes along with that is to pick up also on what you were saying about rationality and that we see our views as being rational because we have a sense that there is this objective thing called rationality and if you use it it will lead you to the truth whereas i would see that rationality is perspective dependent so when we put the blinkers up of our own ideas and we're looking straight down a, a narrow tube our choices appear rational to us because we've got all these unconscious things going on in the background that inform our worldview and everyone else is then irrational. Absolutely. And it's an interesting one, isn't it? That we believe, we believe in, like you say, that we, that we are capable of objectivity when by definition, as you say, there's, there's really no such, no such thing. We can't have a rationality free of, free of, free of the lenses through which we're looking. So, when we're not aware of what those lenses are, like you say, we'll, we'll believe that, well, of course I'm right, Richard, it's very clear, I'm being rational, objective, it's you who's unreasonable. <clears throat> and when we're all doing that, we're all missing, we're all missing what our lenses are and even what somebody else's lenses might be. So, yes. so I think I think that's one of the one of the interesting things. You know, I, I noticed it the other day. I saw a report which I hadn't seen before that um, I think either seven or nine of the poorest areas within the European Union are in the UK, and all of those areas voted to voted for Brexit. Now, as a <clears throat> as somebody who voted Remain, I didn't previously know that. And that piece of information started, started to give me pause. You know, start, I started to reflect on that. I think, wow, I didn't, I didn't know that fact, A. And B, how, how tightly am I holding onto my position so as to not allow it to be mm. affected by that fact? Or, or am, I willing, am I willing for there to be some flexibility in that? However, that, wherever that takes me, Am I willing for my position to be fluid or is it something rigid and, and static? Yeah, not being in the UK, I didn't have to even make a choice on whether I would vote or not. I was <laughs> mercifully removed from that whole thing. And that was interesting. I'm just outside and I could observe, and I did observe that uh, people... I think on both sides, I, I observe them making a lot of assumptions about the other, right? And I think sometimes those assumptions were probably correct, okay? Um, because it was really clear on the emotional effect that Brexit had that leaving the EU, and this was the EU itself, had the EU really represented something to a lot of British people. Um, whether it was that thing in reality or not is another question, but it represented this coming together and a better future and the world transitioning into a better place and the sense of direction the world should inevitably be going in this greater sense of cooperation and moving away from european tribalism now i'm not saying it is any of those things um but and so 
Brexit then, the vote for it, represented a regressive loss of that to kind of barbaric people from somewhere else who would ruin this thing. <laughs> you know? Yeah. This sense of anger came yeah. up. And I think the, the key part of what you just said is when these things become almost, um, well, they become symbolic, don't they? They, be, they become representative of so much more. I think it, it, it then is important to, to see what are those things representing to us? Because clearly for the people who voted for Brexit, the EU, the EU, EU represented something completely different to them, didn't yeah. it? It represented something that constantly got in the way and was obstructive and all those other things. So I think when we become aware that the thing we're talking about isn't the thing that we're seeing, seeing it as, when we become aware of how we're constructing the thing, I think we're freed up to see it at least a little more clearly. You know, it's about taking some, at least some of the scales away from our eyes so that we can see like, oh, what I thought that was is actually a collection of my, my beliefs, my images, yeah, sure. my, my, it, that it's my construct, it's not it. Yes.